So that's what controls. I like the presentation to be very concise and with as few pages as possible. In other words, if you're going to put a complaint in, a complaint that's six or seven pages is going to, is going to be more likely to be read than a complaint that's 50 pages long. I mean, who wants to read? You should be able to make your case without spending a lot of time with paperwork. You know, generally you have 15 pages to get your complaint noted. So if it's longer than 15 pages, you don't have to have an excuse. He will have an excuse not, to, the judge will have an excuse not to read it as it is conventionally considered the maximum length. I think arra arra arranging it to have to have a summary at the beginning that gives an extremely short Reader's Digest description of what you are trying to accomplish. Next, to, next, you will have to present the facts that support your claim, where all the facts, and this will include absolutely no opinion of yours, or conclusions of yours, or hearsay evidence, etc. Just facts. So, on this date, the bank sent me a letter, and the title of the letter, and the date of the letter, and whatever. Right? You have to identify things. But it's facts. It's a fact. And your position is that if I can prove these facts, then the law should apply to me. No hearsay evidence because you're going to have to have somebody testify to the facts being true. Right? It's, it's your testimony, but, it, but if you're going to have somebody, if you're going to put some facts in that somebody else is going to testify to, then you're going to name the person who's going to testify and put them in as facts. So, people or papers you have in your possession, you can subpoena. You can subpoena, you know, people or papers to um, to be presented in court. Next, I want to have my court, and it is my court because I present the evidence to support my right to claim my court in my opening statement in the summary. The first challenge is to, a challenge to jurisdiction. So, what's a challenge? Now, let's go back and look at the. Um, the opening statement here, right, comes now the Constitutional Court and finds Jose Gillian and Gary Byron in contempt of the authority of the Constitutional Court for violations of its orders in writing and in the presence of the Constitutional Court on January 5th, 2010. And then we have a footnote here. What's the Constitutional Court? We go down to the footnote. California Constitution, Article 6, Section 1, the judicial power of this state is vested in the Supreme Court, Courts of Appeal, Superior Courts, and Municipal Courts, all of which are courts of record. So I'm pointing out that the Constitutional Courts are a court of record. I'm, I'm a court of record. And then, in addition, the, def, the legal definition from Black's Law 4th revised in 1968 is, quote, court, the person and the suit of the sovereign. So I've already demonstrated in previous writings that I have claimed that I'm one of the people, and as the people are the sovereigns of the state, then I'm a sovereign. The place where the sovereign sojourns with his regal retinue, wherever that may be. So if I go to court, it's still my court while I'm there. Now we're going to read the definition of jurisdiction from Black's Law. And that is, it is the power conferred by the Constitution or by law. And when they say law, they mean common law. Corby versus Dooley, 313 Illinois Appellate, 509, comma, 40, N, period, E, period, second, 581, comma, 584. And that's from Black's Law, 4th, page 991. And then I'm going to read you another definition of court from Black's Law. An agency of the sovereign created by it directly or indirectly under its authority. So if I'm sovereign and I create my own court consisting of one or more officers, hey, I can be the only officer of the court, established and maintained for the purpose of hearing and determining issues of law. Now, let's read that again. Law, every time they say law, it's common law, so issues of common law. In fact, regarding legal rights and alleging violations thereof and of applying the sanctions of the law authorized to exercise its powers in the course of law at times and places previously determined by lawful authority. So I determine when the time and place is. And that's Ispel versus Stovall, Texas Civil Appellate Court, 92 Southwest 2nd, 
1067 and 1070. Those are the pages. And this is from Black's Law, 4th edition, 1968, page 425. We go on to jurisdiction is control, right? The definition of if I have jurisdiction over you, I have control over you. And, and if I have control over you, then basically you're my slave, right? Because it's a master-slave relationship. So since slavery has been abolished, there is no way that jurisdiction can be an element that is constantly in force against me. Nobody can have jurisdiction over me all the time. So jurisdictions control the right to forcibly make someone answer to a controversy. If the king of France comes to this country and gets a speeding ticket, does any court in this country have jurisdiction to force the king to come and answer to the charges? We all know this is not true. That's why we have to send extradition orders to other countries to get them to come to get them to force one of their subjects to come over here. No, the rules are made for the subjects that are duty bound to obey the rules those rules and not for others. If a citizen of Mexico steals property from someone in the United States, can't the Mexican consulate have him extradited back to Mexico because the U.S. has no jurisdiction over Mexico's subjects? The two countries, or sovereigns, and they like countries like to consider themselves sovereign when actually they're not, can dispute the control over the man, and so can I, as one of the people, what a definition of one of the people would be, sorry, Quote, at the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people. Sovereignty devolved on the people. And they are truly the sovereigns of the country, but they are sovereigns without subjects, with none to govern but themselves. And this is from a Supreme Court decision, Chisholm versus Georgia, U.S. 2 Dahl, 419, 454, and that's from 1793. Being sovereign, dispute to control dispute the control that a legal fiction, i.e. the st <coughs> state or the bank, in other words, the plaintiff in, the, in your case, have over me. Are they not foreign to me as we are dissimilar entities? I mean, they're legal fictions, dead entities, and I'm a living soul. It's when the state or bank claims that they have jurisdiction because you have an address in the state, that is false because it assumes they have control all the time. If they have jurisdiction or control all the time, then you are a slave because you cannot be free and under the jurisdiction all the time, or there is a master-slave relationship. So I believe jurisdiction is acquired rather than constant. It is acquired when you have violated the common law by trespassing on your neighbor. This is best shown in a Supreme Court decision from 1905. I'm going to read this decision. It's Hale versus Henkel. The, quote, the individual may stand upon his constitutional rights as a citizen. He is entitled to carry on his private business in his own way. His power to contract is unlimited. He owes no such duty to the state since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. That's the purpose of the state. His rights are such as existed by the law of the land long antecedent to the organization of the state. So what law was, was pro existed prior to the organization of the state? Common law. And can only be taken from him by due process of law. That means in a court and in accordance with the Constitution. Among his rights are a refusal to incriminate himself and the immunity of himself and his property from arrest or seizure except under a warrant of the law. He owes nothing to the public. He don't, doesn't owe, you don't owe your neighbor anything. He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights. Hale v. Henkel, 201 U.S. 43 in 1905. The acquisition of jurisdiction in a common law trespass where your neighbor has hit someone as this is a trespass upon the man's personal property. What's his personal property? His body is his property. In statutory acts, it is expressed as corpus delecti. So let's see a few examples of case law describing this. Mark Stevens' website has a long list of corpus delecti case law listed for each, you know, for each state.
in every criminal trial, the prosecution must prove the corpus delecti or the body of the crime itself, i.e. the fact of injury, loss, or harm, and the existence of a criminal agency as its cause. You have to have criminal intent, okay? And what's an injury, loss, or harm? If you were like drunk in public and you're being charged with that as a, uh, you know, a, a crime under the penal code, then is there an injury, loss, or harm? Now we notice it says in every criminal trial, right? So a misdemeanor charge or a felony charge is a criminal trial. If you're being charged in a criminal trial, there has to be a f the fact of injury, loss, or harm. And this is a California case, um, People versus Sap, Cal, California from 2003. And People, this is quoting from People versus Alvarez, a 2002 case, 27 Cal 4th, 1161, 1168 through 1169, 119 Cal Reporter 2nd. So, if you have a criminal case, then there has to be a fact of injury, loss, or harm presented and some facts supporting that claim that there's been an injury to be proven, or there's no jurisdiction or right to proceed with a trial, as there is no claim upon which relief can be granted that has been presented. The real question is who, and I mean a man or a woman, is claiming that you injured them. I mean, you're never, you never have a claim against you by one of the people. Now, the California uh, Code states that all writs and suits shall be processed in the name of the people. Well, that's fine. You can process it in the name of the people, but you better have a person who's a witness to come and testify. In other words, if your neighbor sees you hit uh, another man over the head with a baseball bat, he doesn't have to know your name. All he has to do is tell the policeman, I saw that guy hit that man over the head with a baseball bat, and they'll take you in and arrest you for that. And when you go to court, they don't have to have your name. All you have to have is that person as a witness. That witness's testimony becomes the charge. So, have they presented any facts that a person has been injured and that an injury has occurred? In addition to this challenge to jurisdiction, you can find all sorts of violations of their own codes to include as defects in their case, making their accusations false and fraudulent in that they fail to answer your administrative presentment, claiming they don't have these things since without having these things they had knowledge and they were proceeding against you anyway, knowledge that you had complained about it. After failing to provide proof of claim or to show cause why they, the DA, had the right to proceed, or the bank had the right to proceed. If it's a civil case where the bank or credit card is suing you for a breach of contract, then the jurisdiction is acquired when they can present facts that support their claim that they have suffered a, law, a loss due to your actions. This is expressed as, no party has the right to sue unless they can show standing and here are some standing cases from Mark Stevens' website. So, it says, Over the years, our cases have established that the irreducible constitutional minimum of standing, notice it says constitution, that's U.S. Constitution, minimum of standing contains three elements. First, the plaintiff must have suffered an injury in fact an invasion of a legally protected interest which is concrete and particularized, quote, actual or imminent, not conjectural or hypothetical. Of course, it has all these court case sites to support that. Second, there must be a causal connection between the injury and the conduct complained of. The injury has to be fairly traceable to the challenged action of the defendant and not result, the result of the independent action of some third party not before the court. Third, it must be likely as opposed to merely speculative that the injury will be redressed by a favorable decision. And this is from Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife 504 U.S. 555 from 1992. That's another Supreme Court decision. 